This is a song that we wrote for a truly one of the greatest South Africans um, in history, Nelson Mandela, and we'd like to open the show tonight with a tribute to him. God bless you. Thank you. Well, uh, it is a uh, music <coughs> and dancing that makes me at peace with the world. And, and at peace with myself. But I don't see much movement at the back there, you know? <coughs> I would like us to join. Let's just repeat. Let's just repeat it. Okay. Let's just repeat it. Let's all Yeah. 
ladies and gentlemen, Huyamora Malweni, uh, welcome to the seventh day of the Madiba Land World Literary Festival. We've got uh, quite a few poets lined up for this session. Um, I hope that all the poets are here. I haven't checked, but our poets are Chris Abani, Kubus Moolman, Adila Aku, Vernon Head. I know that those four should be here. And Emma Neal was here and she said she had to run and she'll be back in five to 10 minutes. So could I hopefully see all of you to put me out of my suffering and just to let me know uh, that you are here. I can see Adila. I can see Kubus Moolman's name. Kubus, good to see you. Um, I can see Emma Neal's name there. And, oh, let me just see. Okay, that's that. And right, let's go with what we have. Kubus, if you can unblock uh, your mic, um, all three of you, Adila, Emma, and Kubus, and um, if we have time, we'll look at who's on the attendees, oh, but the attendees cannot speak because I see quite a few poets on the attendee list, but not to worry. Um, welcome to the three of you. Kurbis Moolman is a, a well-known writer from South Africa, uh, predominantly known as a poet, but also short stories. Um, Adila Aku is an up-and-coming poet from Peter Maddotsburg, and Emma Neal is a poet from New Zealand. And uh, Emma spoke, uh, I think, about two days ago on her novel, Billy Bird, and Corvus will speak, I think, tomorrow on his new book. So welcome to the three of you thus far, and hopefully others will join us who were supposed to be on the program. But if I can say, um, maybe let's say ladies first and Emma will give you the opportunity to start off with a poem or two and if you want to introduce yourself further feel free to to do so. Oh, thank you very much it's wonderful to see the others that those who I can see so far and um, thanks again for the invitation. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that because it's only about half past five in the morning here in New Zealand that the most <laughs> suitable poem to start with would be one called Obad. Through the wall we hear the baby try out vowels and notes, an oboist practicing arpeggios and scales, or a very small orchestra testing acoustics. We can hear him hearing we can hear him trying to watch the tones drift against the walls and ceiling, rebound slowly like small orbs propelled by miniature flames, dissolve as smoke does, leave a small trickle of water where they have hit the floor and disappeared. Oh, oh, oh. So that was from my, um, one of my collections called Spark. And um, I will move on to another, another collection, um, which is called Tender Machines. And like, like with Billy Bird, the novel, actually, um, the illustration for the, the cover of this book was actually done by that baby that I mentioned in, in that poem. Um, when he was a teenager, he went through a stage of being really interested in, in the fine arts. Um, and this, this next poem is actually also about um, life with small children. Um, based, it's based on my second son. And I guess the fact that I've chosen those two poems to start with probably shows that um, I do tend to draw from um, events I've witnessed or things from family life. Um, but I have started to move more away from that into, into work that looks at, um, I guess, more global or um, political themes as my children have got older and as I've been less kind of all consumed by by that um, very early stage of, of parenthood. But anyway, this one, I guess, is one that fuses um, the personal and 
and the larger, I would hope. It's called Natural Justice. This small boy with buttery curls, soft as bantam feathers, cheeks and limbs that make old folk want to hold a festival of pinch and squeeze. He's got an arsenal. He has alien blam blam space guns. He says, if there are wild animals starved outside, he will stab them with his stabbers. And if there are baddies, he will slice them with his slices. How will you know they're baddies? He's shocked. Because they've got guns to shoot us. But if you've got space guns and slices, won't they think you're a baddie too? Well, baddies want to steal our things. They want to dead us and take our stuff. What if the baddies are just scared, hungry, don't have a home, they're cold and lonely, only about to shoot because we seem angry and as if we might fire first? Well then, they might not be baddies, just dumb goodies, but they still shouldn't shoot us, so blam blam blam! Wait, let's go back over this. They've got guns, but you do too. If they see your guns first, no! He drops the Nerf blaster, refuses water, stories, turns his back, finds his cuddle cloth, at its soft sweet body musk, bows his head like a man just read his rights to silence. Emma, I think we'll, we'll go around a bit, so give you time to look up your next few poems. Um, I think Let's go to Adila, Adila next. Um, if you can read a poem, please, a poem or two, and uh, then we'll go to Quirbus. Good evening. It's evening here. So. And good morning to you, Emma. Um, Hi. I will be starting off with a poem called Within from my collection, uh, Lost in a Quatrain. It says, Dare I awaken dreams long forgotten? Dare I even touch? Dare I say words long comatose? Dare I erupt? Dare I resuscitate a sleep within the bard I used to love? And this one, I think everybody would relate to. It's called Empty Chairs um, with COVID. I'm sitting at the table across empty chairs, thinking of the ones who once sat here Laughter echoes through the air, conversations, connections, then slowly disappear. And I'm left sitting at the table, staring at empty chairs, missing the ones who once sat there. Thank you so much, Adila. Um, Corvus, are you there, my friend? Daryl, I am here, but uh, the video seems to be off. Um, next to mute, can you see a, a, a video button that says stop video? Maybe there's right. a red. Yeah, there, there you go. There, there you go. You look like you're in a torture chamber with the globe above your head. Um, you know, you know, in those movies, they show how they torture people. But anyway, carry on, Corvus. <laughs> Thanks, Daryl. And unfortunately, the uh, light is probably <laughs> gleaming off the top of my bald head. But uh, <laughs> let that be as it is. Anyway, yeah. Carol, thanks very much. Um, it's really great to be here. Thank you. I'll just to start off. I'll just read two poems from the new collection and uh, we'll see where we go from there. Okay, so this poem is called Blue Door. All is still sky bangs a blue door in the face of burning rock. Barely birds move, small high stones through air dry as sunlight. I am shadow sheltered in the stoop of a small tree. I am salt that tastes of seeing, old bone cracked beneath the weight of insects. And um, Emma read a poem. Emma, thank you very much for your poem, Obeyed. Um, so I, I wasn't going to read this poem, but seeing as you uh, 
have charted the territory before us, I shall follow. Obeyed. The sky is burned ahead of them. All the trees have fallen flat. The moon is late and is said to be losing. Wind is predicted for the streetlights. They might be lying together, catching their breath. They might be dressing silently, filling their eyes for the long drought ahead. Or none of these, really. Only birds keening amongst the leaves. The road is empty ahead of them. The sidewalks are solitary again. Silence has the shock of skin sliced through the middle. Okay, thank you so much for that, Quibus. Round one. Okay, Emma, we'll start again with you. Let's go back around the table. Okay. Um, beautiful readings from the other two poets. Um, I kind of need to sit with all those works for a while, but on we go. Um, I'll read one that's actually a kind of prose poem, and it's from Tender Machines, and just one piece of social context that might might help listeners is that I wrote it in 2014, um, which wasn't long after the National Party was um, elected in New Zealand, achieving, I think, the highest majority that they had under mixed member parliament, which is our system of voting, um, the, the highest number that they had under that system. So we had a swing to the right um, at that stage in, in our political history. And that, that should help you with just one or two lines in the poem. It's called Stoic. We couldn't cry about love because you just have to get on with it. And of course there were the children. We couldn't cry about desire unrequited because it's all a lot of water turned away from under the bridge. It might as well not be there. And of course there were the children. We couldn't cry about a lot of things, the cancer and the soldiers and the repressive laws and the children because of the supermarket, the surgeon, the car, the work, the appointments, the decimation of natural habitats, the finances and the decisions, the extracurricular activities for everyone, the aspirations, the deadlines and the dishes, which sounds silly, but you know how it is. You have to get on with it. We couldn't cry about the dishes, the driving or the shopping still being there, even with the cancer and the love and the lust and the children, because after all, you have to get it in perspective. We couldn't cry about the house and the sale and the loss of profit because of the children and the chores and the cancer and voting the right way when everyone else voted the wrong way and protesting with placards, emails and Facebook petitions and of course, above all, again, because of the children. We couldn't cry about it because we weren't after all children and the children were crying about something else altogether and they didn't understand. Of course they didn't. They were only children. We couldn't cry and there were reasons we couldn't cry and they became metaphors, vessels that both carried our tears and concealed them. Because you can't, there's no point. The number of times we could have cried, you just wouldn't read about it. And should I do just one more in this round or? Yeah, okay. yeah go, go for one more. And, and Emma, can I apologize once more? The last time I, I kept you up about one in the morning, and now I hear I've got you up um, five o'clock in the morning, but uh, that's that's just payback for all the rugby matches I had to watch at obscene hours against New Zealand, and most probably we caught a hiding as well. <laughs> well, actually, it's been really interesting getting up at different hours of the day from from my norm. Um, like this morning, I could hear the most amazing bird song. So thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so this, this this one sort of grew out of my my day job. I, I work as an editor, and um, I was working on a really large novel um, about New Zealand's participation in um, both world wars. And at one point, I was making what probably you know you call the global change in a manuscript. And I was thinking about how easy it was to to make that kind of change um, in my job, and how well. I had a fantasy of being able to affect that sort of change um, on a wider level. So the poem's called Global. Search for counterattack, replace with hold. Search for attack, replace with attach. 
Search for murdered, replace with heard. Search for killed, replace with serenaded. Search for ambushed, replace with invited. Search for missile launches, replace with, oh, red silk fans. Search for front line, replace with lamplit threshold. Search for grenades, replace with iris bulbs. Search for smart bombs, replace with crayoned paper folded into lilies, swans. Search for generals, replace with farmers, orchardists, gardeners, mechanics, doctors, veterinarians, school teachers, artists, painters, housekeepers, marine biologists, zoologists, nurses, musicians. Search for combatants, replace with counsellors, conductors, bus drivers, ecologists, train drivers, sailors, firefighters, ambulance drivers, historians, solar engineers, designers, seamstresses, artesian well drillers, builders, search for profits, replace with profits, save as new world, dot, doc. Thank you, Emma. Okay, Adira, we'll go to you. This next poem is called Coupling, and I'm sure all the writers would relate to this one. Tossing and turning, words won't let me sleep. Rhyming and coupling, emotions running deep. I contemplate waking to write it all down, but don't want to disturb you, don't want you to frown. I try very hard to remember each word over and over, silently, unheard. I plan by the morning to record it afresh, but duty takes precedence, so it remains just to wish. When I finally find time to ink it all in, my mind has already recycled the thing. So I stare at the paper, trying hard to recall that great wonder that would have impressed you all. But the words refuse to come like they did in my bed. So it may very well be said that my very best work remained in my head. Um, are you going to read another one, Adila? Are you holding it oh, back for the next? Okay. Um, okay. The next one is called Wrapped Up. What is this life that wraps us up in tests, that has us fleeing the demons of yesterday, only to find them further down the path, waiting to trip us up again? And I look at you so wrapped up in old wounds that your demons dance dizzily around you, so cocooned in the pains of your past that you're afraid to let go, afraid to heal, for healing means removing that crutch to which you cling far too much. And you fear that healing may snatch away memories, those very same memories that sustain your suffering, keeping your wounds raw. And I'm tired, but you remain wrapped up. So you didn't notice that moment. I let go. Thank you, Adila. Quibus, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> before I read, I just want to thank Adila and Emma for their, their poems this evening. And, uh, yeah. Okay, this poem is called The House. At the bottom of his, sorry, I'll, I'll start again. At the bottom of his glass is a small house with a small mother inside. The house has green walls and a green roof too. And there are buckets inside the ceiling for loneliness. The small mother is heavy and bent of an aluminium walker that goes ahead of her everywhere she goes. The small house and the small mother get smaller the further he moves his glass away. The small house and the small mother have water inside every part of them that is not sealed with packing tape. At the bottom of his glass, is a sealed cardboard box with the scent of orange blossom and jasmine. But he is unable to swallow anything anymore. Neither birds with long beaks, nor salt, 
neither the seed pod of a plane tree nor the scent of regret. For the small house is dissolving. Now he feels something irrefutable scar the back of his throat. <clears throat> And <clears throat> this poem is called Little Girl. It's a kind of a list poem, so it's built out of a series of um, entries, can I call them? Entries that are attached to particular people who you will meet in the poem. Little Girl. Her grandmother sits on the green plastic chair with the broken back. Her mother sits on an upturned black label crate. Her sister sits and sleeps on her mother's lap. Her auntie, on her mother's side, sits on the stump used for chopping wood and for chopping off the heads of chickens. Her mother's disabled cousin sits in her wheelchair, the one with the stupid front wheel. Her father hasn't been seen for years since he left to find work on the citrus farms near Clan William. She sits on the bare earth with her legs crossed and her blue school skirt tucked tight beneath her legs in case her father should ever come back. Oh, that was powerful, Corvus, powerful. Um, okay, I'm going to give each one of you your last poem each. Adila, we'll start with you this time. Okay. Um, this one is called, You Are a Woman. You Must Learn to Live with Being Sore. I chose, I wasn't going to go with this one, but going with Pope. Corbus's poem, um, a grandmother's advice. You are a woman. You must learn to live with being sore, giving all you have to give, even when you have nothing more. Why worry about degrees? You'll end up with the pots and pans anyway. So learn them well. Learn to run a home. Learn to be the perfect wife. Learn to sacrifice. But what about me? What about you? You are a woman. You must learn to live with being sore. Perfect your pies, samosas, chutneys, and palau. Even when you want to cry, learn to smile somehow. This world will test you. Learn to be strong. Say you're sorry, even when you've done nothing wrong. But what about me? What about you? You are a woman. You must learn to live with being sore. What does it matter if you are intelligent, vibrant, vital yet soft, with a peppering of beauty, charm and grace? Still, you must learn your place. Don't look for more. But what about me? What about you? You are a woman. You must learn to live with being sore. Prepare to be invisible and follow where you led. You know you complete half your faith the day that you were wed. Don't refuse your husband. Take care of your marital bed. But what about me? What about you? You are a woman. You must learn to live with being sore. You will be taken for granted. You may be hurt to your very core and still be asked to give a little more. That is why I stress you must learn to live with being so. But what about me? What about you? You are a woman. You must learn to live with being so. Raise your children well, even though they may one day leave and never look back. In Allah's hands, you must leave the rest. Do your best. But what about me? What about you? I am a woman. I have learned to live with being sore, and I have leaped my soreness into my prayers pure. For I have carried the soreness of this ancient dirge, 
but my soreness has formed a chrysalis and a tiger butterfly is about to emerge. Thanks, Adila. Okay. Um, Emma, we'll ask you and then we'll end with Corbus. Thank you. I really like the way that last poem, the, the constraints of form echoed the, the restrictions that the, the content was talking about. I thought that was really effective. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the next piece I'll read kind of walks that thin beam between prose poetry and, and flash fiction maybe. And um, it grew out of a childhood memory, but or a teenage memory, but it, it sort of flies off into fiction towards the end. It's called The Local Pool. Turn a corner into air tangy with chlorine. The smell removes memory's stopper and an anxious genie swims out. What about the turquoise of a small town pool? What about concrete dark with raw shark marks that wet bodies left behind after boys egged on and watched? <clears throat> Police found by a passerby the next day when their own girls cried see ya over pop radio falsetto did the cops saloon door from their bathrooms, half scented with soap, then gruff up quick hugs, foam chins hooked over their daughters' shoulders to hide the fuel lines of dread in their eyes? The mothers of the pool girl's friends, did they slash open packets, shove cupboards shut, slam on about hemlines and torn black tights, peep showing lucky pennies of skin, because grown women can't just wish link pinkies to ward off a suburb sons. The girl's friends asked by social workers to tell when she skipped classes because she had to get back on track. Mustn't let one summer dusk haunt her with that boy crisping her open, peeling her back like the winding key on a tin of imported sweets. Did those friends stop reporting because tears scurred free as she begged, please don't. Or because they learned she'd agreed to meet the boy again at a bus shelter's cold bunker <clears throat> and the red folded mystery of how a wound could drag her back to its own start was too confusing. As disorienting as the acrid smoke they heard about later when a school bag, school books, stockings, wasp striped school tie were soaked in art room turps and set alight as a girl prayed for flames to leap a pine plantation's fire break, hive for the new subdivision and one blue house, its yard junked with bikes and a boy's outgrown clobber slung into trash bags, slumped limp as drunks. Thank you so much, Emma, for sharing that. Quibus, over to you. Thanks, Daryl. <clears throat> um, I think as, as a way of closing, I'm going to read a love poem, if, if I'm allowed to read love poetry. Uh, um, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, in 20, uh, I think about 2010, I, I spent a couple of months, about three months in Canada, in Calgary. Uh, doing research as part of my PhD, uh, I was doing research into the long poem, the, uh, the tradition of the long poem, and there's a particularly very powerful tradition of, of the long poem in, um, in Canadian literature, and, and, and I, 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 yeah, I just learned, I learned so much. Um, so this is a poem written for my wife, Julia, who you know, Daryl. Um, and the poem is called, I Carry a Geography. I carry a geography of the dark with me across oceans, frozen lakes, mountains whiter than ice where wind contours a need urgent as flesh. This dark, the dark I know that does not ever, even in the glare of dreaming, leave me. This recognition, familiar and strange as any echo returning white across a frozen sea. This dark is you. As long as you, like the dark, carry absence in the shape 
I carry with me everywhere. The, the geography of a heart in two halves. Okay, Kubis, thank you so much. Before I close, um, since two poets let us down, I'm going to read the poem that I launched this festival with. Um, and it's a poem by Brayton Breitenbach, and I'll read the Afrikaans, and then I'll read the English, and then I'll come back. Seisun in die Paradies. Mach dar altijd de lucht brand in jelle hees. Mach die padders jelle onthou. Mach die appels al jaar soeter word. En die dreven priel groener. Mach jelle vrienden wijn saam bring vir die keer. Mach die hees wat jelle betrek, dier trek blij. Van die geer van siederhout en malfa blare. Mach die walle van jelle slote nie te gauw in kalve en instort nie, so dat die water nog helderder daarin kan vloei. Mag die sterre en die berg en die stilte oor jelle en jelle gesin bly waak, nou en more en more se aand en elke van daarie da se nacht. And then the English version. May there always be a light in your house, May the frogs remember you. May your apples grow sweeter every year and your grape arbor greener. May your friends always bring over some wine. May the house you have built be redolent of the fragrance of cedar wood and geranium leaves. May the walls of your ditches not collapse and fall apart too quickly so that the water can flow even more brightly in them. May the stars and the mountains and the silence stand guard over you and your family, now and tomorrow and every morning and evening and every day's night. And that was the poem that I included in the write-up to, in my invitation to all writers. Um, and, and that was the dream for the festival. But I want to say to Kurbus and to Emma and to Adila, Thank you for, for such, such beautiful poetry today. I, I always get worried when people let me down, uh, but it, it worked out beautifully and we got to hear poems that most probably we wouldn't have. And I wish you well. I wish you lots of creative journeys and uh, may the ink never dry in your pens. So, so thank you so much, Corbus. I shall see you hopefully sometime soon. Emma, hopefully sometime in South Africa, and Adila, hopefully sometime in Richmond, you said you wanted to come. We'll see what happens whenever people can meet. So thank you to everyone. We'll have a short break, and then we'll come back for the last session. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Okay, thank you, thank you Emma. Thanks, then, Corbus. Bye. Bye.